A very good morning, friends and family in Jesus. Um, thank you for this opportunity again this morning to present the Word of God to you. Um, hopefully we are all ready to get into the Word this morning. Uh, before we do that, let's please just open in prayer. Father God, in the name of your Son Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for the gift of life, Lord Jesus. Thank you for those of us whom you have touched in this week in a powerful way. Thank you, Lord, for revelation of the truth of your word for some of us, Lord. We pray, Father God, that as we get into your word this morning, that even though we are not physically together, but in spirit, Lord, that the Holy Spirit has bound us together as the body of Christ. And we thank you for that, Father God, that we will open your word, that we will learn from your word, Father God, that we will love your word, respect it, treat it exactly as it is supposed to be treated, Lord, as the true word of God, as the bread of life, and as everything that we need, Lord, to give us answers in this life that we are living right now. So we thank you for that, Father God. Lord, we pray that everyone that is still out there that is mentally, physically, or spiritually um, crying out to you for, for uh, healing in some way, we pray that the Holy Spirit right now will do his perfect work in their lives, and will touch them in a powerful way. And we pray and we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. <clears throat> Thank you, friends and family, again. Um, so this morning, we are going to be having a look at four scripture verses. So uh, before we get into the scripture verses, just want to apologize if somewhere in this message I might sound a little flat or monotoned or whatever it is. Um, I'm still battling a little bit with energy and um, concentration. So we are going to be looking at four scriptures this morning. And the Lord's going to show us in these four scriptures one very specific truth about life, especially life in the kingdom of God, what we have, um, the, the path that we have chosen to walk here on earth. Each one of us has chosen that, that path. Each one of us has chosen a specific direction that we are going into. And some of us have, we've made up our minds that it doesn't matter um, who says what to us, it doesn't matter how much people say to us, once we have made up our minds to pave a path for ourselves, um, we're going to remain on that specific path. And so I want to start with a scripture this morning out of the book of Philippians. So Philippians chapter 2, if anyone wants to follow there. And we are going to be reading from verse 2. A very, very popular scripture. Um, but the Lord is going to pull one piece out of the scripture. And we're going to take it from there. And we're going to see what the Spirit of God does in this, this morning. So Philippians chapter 2 from verse 2. The Bible says, therefore, if you have any encouragement, from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, which is the Holy Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded. Having the same love, being one in spirit and one in mind, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. 
rather in humility, value others above yourself. Not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ. That is a powerful statement, that family. Let's read that again and listen to it with our spirits. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ. Verse 6, who being the very nature, God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue shall acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. A family in this whole scripture that we read now, we're going to concentrate and focus on these last three verses. Verse 9. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at that name, the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Now family, when the trumpet sounds and when Jesus returns for that judgment day, when everything is being settled by Christ, there are going to be two types of people. The first type is going to be the type that is described in the beginning of the scripture. The type of person that selflessly gave themselves up to be servants in the kingdom of God. To do everything in the same mindset as Jesus himself. Did he? So the first type of person at the second coming of Jesus is going to be a victorious person. It is going to be those who were fully dedicated with everything inside of them. Those who picked up their cross daily and followed Jesus. Those who denied themselves the pleasures in life. Who denied themselves the things that this world has to present and has to offer. Those that walked in the spirit. Those that worshipped in truth. And so the first type of person that you will find at the second coming of Jesus is going to be the victorious kind. The second type of person that we are going to find at the second coming of Jesus family is going to be those that are going to be filled with horrible regret. Now I think each one of us listening to this this morning, we can raise our hands and we can say that yes, somewhere in our lives, we have experienced regret somewhere. There's maybe regret in some of us in how we raised our children in certain areas there's maybe regret in some of us in how we treated our husbands or our wives. There's maybe regret in some of us of 
not stepping out in faith in a certain area in our lives so that we could then become more powerful in our walk with Christ and in our lives in and through the Holy Spirit. And so yes, family, in each one of us, there might be regret at this very moment, but at the second coming of Jesus Christ, the difference between the regret we have now and the regret that the people are going to face then is, if you and I are battling with that regret right now, there might still be a possibility for you and me to fix it. We still have a second chance. We still have time. If we open our eyes this morning and we still can breathe and there's still blood flowing through our veins and our heart is still pumping and there's still general function here in the gray matter, then there's a possibility that we can fix that regret that we are living with every single day. And by that I mean, family, that we can go to our Father in heaven as it is written up in the book of Romans and we can ask forgiveness for whatever we feel that we have done wrong. And the Bible teaches us that He is a faithful and a just God and He loves us so much that He gave His one and only Son, Jesus Christ, and that He will forgive us and then it is up to us, family, to step away from that regret, that, those mistakes that we have made. And leave it in the past and then turn to the throne of our Father and move forward. And if we have a look at these next scriptures that the Lord is going to show us, family, we're going to see here the difference in what this first scripture has just showed us now. Victory or regret. Now this next uh, story we, <clears throat> we've uh, read a few times. Actually, the next three stories we've ministered a few times here in church. But the Lord just led me to bring them up again this morning just to highlight this point that the Lord wants to show us. So if anyone wants to follow in the book of Numbers, Numbers chapter 13, we are going to be reading from verse 1. And so here is where Moses, the leader of the Israelites in the desert, they've, they've uh, gotten to the, uh, the border of the promised land. And Moses is now sending 12 spies into the promised land to go and scope out what is happening there and to come back and to give an account on what they saw to the Israelites. Maybe the Israelites weren't very excited about going into the promised land and this was a way of God getting the uh, Israelites excited about what Father God had for them. And so if we pick up in, in verse 1, so Numbers 13 verse 1, the Bible says, the Lord said to Moses, send men to explore Canaan, which I'm giving to the Israelites. Send one leader from each of their ancestral tribes. So there's 12 tribes at this stage uh, in Israel. And so Father God says, take one leader from each tribe and send them out. And so from verse 3 up until verse 15, uh, they name all these leaders. Uh, one of them in verse 6 is uh, the man named Caleb. And we're going to read further about him uh, in, in a bit. So verse 16 it says, These are the names of the men Moses sent to explore the land, the promised land. But Moses gave Hosea, son of Nun, the name Joshua. So, so here, 
in verse 8, we can see that Joshua, the, the, the aid of um, Moses, the, the young man that went into the tent of meetings with him, uh, he sent him out as well with Caleb. And so verse 17, when Moses sent them to explore Canaan, he told them, go through the Negev and then into the mountain region. See what the land is like, whether the people living there are strong or whether they are weak. Is the land they live in good or bad? Do their cities have walls around them or not? Is the soil rich or poor? Does the land have trees or not? Do your best to bring back some of the fruit. It was the season when grapes were beginning to grow and ripen. So verse 21. So here what Moses is saying to the spies. <clears throat> in essence, go in there and get as much information as you can to bring back to us. So that when you speak to us about the promised land, you give us a full picture of everything that is happening there. How the land looks, how the people are, what the fruit and the vegetables and the livestock looks like. <coughs> Excuse me. Verse 21. So the men, the 12 spies, explored the land from the desert of Zin to the border of Hamath. They went through the Negev and came to Hebron, where all these tribes live. They are descendants of Anak. Then if we go down to verse 25, 40 days later, they came back from exploring the land. So the 12 spies went in there and they survived there for 40 days without the people there recognizing them. Now there's a different message in that that we will get to on a different day. So, verse 25, 40 days later, they came back from exploring the land. They came back to Moses, Aaron, and the whole community of Israel at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. They gave their report and showed them the fruit of the land. So this is what they reported. Verse 27. This is what they reported to Moses. We went to the land where you sent us. It really is a land flowing with milk and honey. Here is some of the fruit. But the people who live there are strong and the cities have walls that are very large. We even saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in Negev. The Hittites, Jesuits and Amorites live in the mountain regions. And the Canaanites live along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea and all along the Jordan River. Then verse 30, Caleb told the people to be quiet and listen to Moses. Caleb said, let's go now and take possession of the land. We should be more than able to conquer it. But the men who had gone with him said, we can't attack those people. They're too strong for us. So they began to spread lies among the Israelites about the land they had explored. They said the land we explored is one that devours those who live there. All the people we saw there are tall. We saw the Nephilim. We felt as small as grasshoppers. And that's how we must have looked to them. 
Now, family, if we have a look at this scripture, and we've spoken about this before, but the Lord wants to open up and reveal something to us brand new this morning. We can see that 12 spies went out into this brand new land, this beautiful land of milk and honey. And they came back and the very first report that they gave was, yes, this place is blessed. If you have a look in the King James or the New King James Version, you will see that the spies started off by saying, this is definitely the land of milk and honey. It is a blessed land. So each one of them, those 12 spies, saw the same thing, the same beauty, the same richness, the same splendor in that land. But then unfortunately, family, out of the 12, only two of them, which is Joshua and Caleb, only two of them saw the potential that Father God had for them there. And so the majority of them turned around and the Bible is clear in stating that they moved away and started spreading lies about this promised land that Father God wanted to give to them. Now we're going to get back to that, but if we go to the second story in the book of Judges 7. Now again, we ministered this piece a few weeks ago. And so the Lord wants to just open up something yet to us. We all know the story. Gideon was a cowardly man, a scared man. He was threshing wheat in a wine press, which is a very wrong thing to do in the first place. An angel of the Lord meets him there and calls him a powerful warrior. He then tells him that the Lord wants to deliver Israel and the, and, and the Jews by the hands of Gideon. So Gideon goes out and he gets a huge army together. And then the Lord says to him, this army is too big. You must cut down on this army. And we pick up this piece in Judges 7 verse 1. Early in the morning, Gideon and all the men were camped at the spring of Herod. The camp of Midian was north of them in the valley near the hill of Moriah. The Lord said to Gideon, you have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into their hands or Israel will boast against me. My own strength has saved me. Now announce to the army, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave this mount. So 20,000 men left that day. Now family, keep this in mind. The 20,000 men, when Gideon asked them, who is afraid to go against this army that we are going to face? And 20,000 men raised their hands. And Gideon told them, you may turn around and you may go home. Again, keep that in mind, family. That out of all those thousands of men that Gideon had gathered in, in, in the very beginning, that he only left to face that army with 300 men at the very end. So again here we can see that a very small portion of those that were chosen in the beginning made that final journey to go and take that victory. Now the last story that we are going to be reading this morning is out of the book of John. And again, family, we all know this, this uh, piece, but we're going to see what the Lord is going to show us in this, this morning. So John chapter 6, if anyone wants to follow from verse 45. This is Jesus himself speaking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the crowds of people around him. 
and to his 12 disciples that he has chosen, but also to the hundreds of other disciples that have chosen to follow Jesus at that stage. And Jesus is here telling them that he is the bread of life. That if they do not eat of his flesh, they will not survive. And so John chapter 6 verse 45, it is written in the prophets. They will be taught by God. Everyone who has heard the Father and learned from him comes to me, Jesus. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from the Father. Only he has seen the Father. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I am, I, Jesus, am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Then verse 52, here's where a rumbling is starting. When the Jews began, then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise them up in the last days. Remember, family, we started with um, the scripture about the last days. That in the last day, the day of judgment, when Jesus comes, every knee will bow, every tongue shall confess. And here Jesus says, I will raise them up. In the last days, verse 55, for my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. Just as the Father, just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate the manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. Capernaum is um, the hometown of Jesus. This is why Jesus also said that a prophet is not known in his own hometown. Because this is where Jesus was rejected the most, is in his own hometown. Then verse 60. And this is what the Lord wants to share with us this morning, family. On hearing this, many of his disciples, keep that in mind, family. Not the unbelievers. Not the Pharisees and the Sadducees, not the crowds that followed Jesus. Many of the disciples of Jesus said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept this? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? Then if, then what if you see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? The Spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of Spirit and life. Yet, there are some of you who do not believe, for Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, this is why I told you 
If no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled them. Then verse 66. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Now, family in Jesus, these three stories that we read this morning, let's bring all of them together. And let's see what the Holy Spirit wants to show us in this. The very first story that we read was the story of the 12 spies that went into Canaan, into the promised land, the land that Father God had promised to the Israelites. And for 40 years they had been seeking this promised land. And they got to this point and the majority of them turned away. So 10 of them decided they don't want anything to do with this. And the Bible was clear in stating that they moved away to the other Israelites and started spreading lies about the promised land. Now that was physically Canaan that they were talking about there. But there's spiritually, that, ha that is happening today as well in a lot of the churches, family. Is that there are people that cannot accept the truth of the word of God and they are moving away from God and they are going to the rest of the believers and spreading lies about the promised land, about the new Jerusalem, about the kingdom of God. If we have a look at the second story about the 20,000 men that raised their hands and moved away. And if we have a look at this last story about all these disciples that raised their hands and said, this is too much, we cannot accept this. You know, family, when we read these scriptures, we tend to focus on and have a look at those that went ahead into victory. But this morning, let's give a thought about those that decided to step away, to move away. Not to continue to follow the vision that God had given them. Not to continue to follow the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And family, somewhere in their lives, these disciples that decided to move away from Jesus, maybe a few weeks or months or maybe even a year or so after that, they could see the result in the lives of those disciples that had decided to continue with Jesus and they must have been struck with complete regret at that stage. But at that stage, it was too late for them to turn back. Because they had already spread enough lies. They had already told people about their unbelief. And the people around them had already gotten to know them as the disciples they did not want to or could not follow the truth of Jesus. And so family, we started off in Philippians where it says that one day every knee shall bow. Keep in mind the scripture says every knee. It says every knee in heaven, every knee on earth, and every knee under earth shall bow before Jesus and will acknowledge that he is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. But at that very moment, family, out of all the people that Father God through the Holy Spirit had called to the cross of Jesus to meet his son and to accept his son and to be led and taught by his son and to love his son and the word of God at that very moment on judgment day family just like in these three stories we will be witness to the fact 
that the majority of the people that God had called to give them the promised land, the new Jerusalem one day, will unfortunately be the people that will be standing on the side of regret. Unfortunately, they will be the people that will be kicking themselves, that will be screaming. You know, family, there's many scriptures. We spoke about this last week about Hades and hell. And if we read those scriptures, we can see that it describes the people that have been cast into Hades and hell. It describes them gnashing on their teeth. And there's a reason for that, family. There's two reasons why they are gnashing on their teeth. The first reason is because of pain, the pain that they are experiencing, not only the physical pain of, of the torture and the burning and that worm that is constantly eating at their flesh and them not being able to die, but the pain, family, that they have made that decision to move away from Jesus Christ. The gnashing on their teeth is also because they are angry. Because at that very moment, they will look and see that Jesus is real. And Jesus is the bread of life. And Jesus is the Son of God. And Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And everything began through him and everything will end through him. And so family, at the very end, when Jesus comes to sort everything out, when he separates the sheep from the goats, and he says that the goats must now go to Hades and Hades to hell, and that the sheep will come with him to the new Jerusalem, that is going to be the biggest day of regret ever. So family in Jesus this morning, as we have been privileged again today with the gift of life, I want to call on each one of us as sons and daughters of God this morning, that if there's some way in your life that you still, for whatever reason, refuse to believe in, in the whole truth of the word of God, and you have decided to be one of those majority that has rejected it and moved away from it. And there are some of us, uh, family, there are. I, I, I know that as the shepherd of this beautiful church, I've experienced some of us that have rejected parts of the word of God. That have rejected authority. That have rejected the truth that Jesus has, has spoken. And has gone with our own thoughts and opinions. And what some world evangelist on YouTube has said. And so family I want to call out to you this morning. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And I want to say to you brother and sister in Christ. There is going to come a day. Where your regret and my regret might be too late. And so while we have the opportunity right now. Let us make sure. That we are in right standing with Jesus Christ. You know family as I'm standing here this morning. I myself have lots of regrets. Lots. And as I, I started off this morning by saying that thankfully in Jesus' name and, and these few days that we have had an opportunity to be in the house together as a family, we've been speaking to each other a lot, we've been communicating with each other a lot, there, there hasn't been any um, outside um, influence or, or, or any adding to uh, our conversation or our lives. And so myself and my family, we've been talking a lot and we've been 
We've been interacting a lot and praying a lot and interceding a lot. And, and the Lord has shown us things that we, we need to fix between each other. Because ultimately we have to first look and first fix our own Jerusalem before we try and go out and fix somebody else's Jerusalem. And so family in Jesus, I want to end this morning. I want to, I want to call out to, to each one of us and I want to say, if there's any regret in your life at this stage of any choices that you might have made, that right now at this very moment, the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ is showing you that you must fix right now. Then as we go into prayer this morning, I want to ask you, family, just submit completely to, to Christ. Submit to Jesus. Give it to the Lord and say, Lord Jesus, here I am. I don't want to be like one of these stories the, the, the majority that moved away, those 20,000 soldiers that could have gone with Gideon and could have been part of a massive victory, but they stood on, on, on one side and they witnessed the victory of the 300 soldiers that were bold enough and courageous enough to step forward and to say, we will trust God in this. And just to imagine what they had to live with, those 20,000 soldiers the rest of their lives, that every time one of those 300 soldiers met them, they were struck with defeat already inside of them, knowing that they were too cowardly to move forward, that they were too fearful to go into to battle. So family, let us not be part of that majority. These disciples that decided to reject the truth of Jesus and move away. And then later on see those disciples that stuck with Jesus walking through the streets of Capernaum, the same city that they rejected Jesus in. And they were healing people and baptizing people and raising people from the dead and preaching the gospel. And starting New Testament churches. Family. The Lord Jesus is still good to us. Father God is still very, very good to us. In giving us time to fix this. Let us not continue to live in and with regret. Let us fall down on our knees this morning. And let us submit to our Father in heaven. And let us confess and let us rise up this morning in the power of the Holy Spirit and in the name of Jesus Christ. And let us move forward in the kingdom of God, family in Jesus. So that when that trumpet sounds one day and Jesus comes to pass judgment on every single person, that we may be seen as the victorious ones. Amen. Amen. Please let us pray. <clears throat> Father God, in the name of your Son Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord, I thank you with everything inside of me for the strength, for the power and the endurance, Lord, that you have given me to be able to present this message this morning. I pray, Father, that it would have reached the ears and the hearts of your people, the way that you intended it to be, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father God, for blessing us with the gift of life this morning. Thank you, Father God, for your word and the truth of your word. And so this morning, Father, we want to listen to the call of the Holy Spirit. And we want to say, here we are, Father God, here we are, Lord Jesus. And we confess, Lord, this morning of the things that we have regret for, the things that we have willingly moved aside because we either...
didn't want to accept the truth of the word of God or we didn't have enough boldness or courage. And so this morning, Lord Jesus, we confess in your name and we ask forgiveness, Father God, in the name of your son, Jesus. And we pray, Lord, that you will accept this forgiveness, Lord, this this request on, on, on our side, Father God. That the blood of Jesus Christ will wash over us, cleanse us, clean us, purify us, renew us, make us brand new this morning, Lord. That we may rise up today as the body of Christ together. And that we may stand firm this morning and say that, Lord, we are the ones that believe that you are the bread of life. And that we believe that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And that already now we bow before you, Lord. And we confess that. That you are the only name by whom we can be saved. And so we thank you for that, Father God. We bring you glory, honor, praise, and thanks. Lord, may you please continue to be with us during this week. Everyone that was affected by this virus, Lord, the past uh, week, we pray that the healing hands of the Holy Spirit will touch each one of us, Lord Jesus. Bless us with complete godly healing, that there will be no um, long-lasting uh, effects of, of this, Lord Jesus, but that we will receive complete pure Holy Spirit healing in Jesus' name. Thank you for that, Father. Bring you glory, honor, praise, and thanks in the name of Jesus, your Son. And all of God's people says, Amen and Amen. Family in Jesus, thank you so much. <clears throat> I want to apologize again. If somewhere in the message it was a bit flat, I am I'm still feeling a bit exhausted. Um, so hopefully the Spirit of God um, did a much, much more powerful uh, work than, than I did. <laughs> Amen. Sure. Um, family, have a beautiful week. Have a blessed week. Stay connected to Jesus. Get into the Word of God. Um, continue to pray. Continue to intercede. Uh, put on worship music. I do want to put this message, or I want to end this uh, session by saying this. Um, next week, the Lord has laid on my heart a, a, a powerful message um, about who, who, must me, who must we allow to have um, lay hands on us and pray for us. And who must we allow to have prophesy over our lives? That is a very, very important thing in, in our lives as sons and daughters and, and in the lives of um, the, the body of Christ, of the church. Um, and so just to, uh, just to let everyone know that we are going to get into the word of God concerning that, um, we must not just let anybody... Lay hands on us and pray for us. We must not let anybody or just anybody prophesy over us. There are certain people, and it's written up in the Word of God, there are only certain people that are permitted to lay hands on you and me and pray for you and me and uh, prophesy over you and me. So if you want the truth, of that message, next Sunday, the 22nd, we will be open again um, and we will be gathering together here uh, at our, our beautiful church, Alton Baptist Church. So, family, I hope and pray that you have a blessed week. Um, stick to Jesus, love Jesus, love one another. Um, so until we meet again next Sunday, be absolutely blessed in Jesus' name. Amen.